welcome to another episode of Talking Baseball, the show in which we talk about baseball. I'm Pete Lincoln, your host, and joining me again tonight is my son, Jason Smith. Back for the sequel. Greetings. And what we thought we might like to do for this show is talk about the fact that if you could get in a time machine with Marty McFly and fly back to the Huntington Avenue baseball grounds in Boston in the year 1901, and this would be prior to cars and automobiles and planes and trains and automobiles, and two states actually, and watch the baseball game, you would be astounded to see that the game over the last 115 years has not really changed all that much. Same number of players, same number of innings, same way of playing the game. The fact that anything in this day and age could last 115 years without essential alteration is rather amazing. We thought it'd be kind of interesting to do a show to talk about all the challenges, pitfalls, and dangers that baseball has fallen into in these past 115 years, and then what they did to remedy those things. So that's what we intend to do. But first that, before we get to that, it's trivia it's time. It's trivia time. So we're going to start out with a couple JV questions for the casual fans and then sort of uh, work our way up to the master level here. So one of the topics we're going to talk about today is the DH. And the DH was first implemented in 1973. And our first question is, who was the first official DH in Major League Baseball? So mull that one over. The varsity question is going to be, in 1997, when interleague play began, so the National League players had to use a DH in the American League parks, who was the first National League designated hitter? And on to the next question, another topic we're going to be discussing is interleague play. And the JV question is, which league has a better record in interleague play, the American League or the National League? So you have a 50-50 shot. And for the real aficionados, although there are a lot of this team's aficionados kicking around the major leagues, which individual team has the best one lost record in the 14, no, it's more than that, uh, 17 years the DH has existed in the National League as well. All right. Baseball almost immediately was a cash cow. Professional baseball had been played since 1876, but it was a simply one league, the National League primarily. But when the two leagues began in 1901, it didn't take long, especially with the advent of the World Series in 1903, for baseball to become extraordinarily popular. So by 1910, 11, 12, uh, baseball was becoming uh, a huge cash cow. Like any cash cow situation, someone else wants to get in to divide up the spoils. So beginning in 1913, and especially active in the years 14 and 15, the Federalist League began. And the Federalist League was successful because they didn't have any sort of long-range contract. Every player was a free agent. You were signed for a single year. Now, by doing that, a lot of players that had felt they were bound to their teams felt they might get a better salary if they jumped to the Federalist League. And so at first, a lot of Major League players jumped. A lot of players jumped from the Mexican League. And a lot of players that were still in the minor leagues uh, joined rapidly. So an 18 league began that did pretty well. What put the first damper on that was the powers to be in the major leagues declared that any player who jumped was banned for life or ever playing again in the major leagues. And that curtailed the number of players that were actually going to make the jump. Or they simply paid them more and bought them out. So that when Walter Johnson was offered a contract and signed actually a contract with a Federalist League team, the Senators said, Walter, we'll pay you whatever you want, but it'd be more than them. So he withdrew his contract and went back to playing for Washington. I think another damper is that of the eight teams, four of them were in cities that already had established teams. That's right. And uh, there were also cities like Buffalo and Indianapolis that were not exactly uh, population and baseball havens at the time. So they were sort of doomed from the start, too. So was lots of reasons why the league quite never caught on. And so it folded. And like, well, in football, for instance, the AFL started in 1960, and the ABA lasted for a while. There's always someone trying to break in, but no other league has ever tried to break into the major leagues ever since. So from 1915, 100 years later, we're still operating with the same basic premise. The one leftover, and I mm -hmm. kind of find this amusing, yeah. the one leftover from the Federal League was that Wrigley Field in Chicago 
home of the Chicago Cubs, was originally built for the Chicago Whales. And the Chicago Whales won the Federalist League Championship in 1915. And so it's somewhat ironic that the last time Wrigley Field hosted a world champion was for the Chicago Whales. 100 years later, there's still never been a Cubs World Series champion. We're not trying to rub it in, Cubs fans. It's just a, it's <laughs> just a, just a teats. <laughs> yeah, just a little bit. Just a little bit. Now, there were three killer occurrences at the end of the 19, 1919s. The first was World War I. World War I broke out. It only lasted a year and a half, but a lot of major leaguers were drafted and were called into service. Hank Gowdy of the Boston Braves was the first major league leaguer to go. And so a lot of uh, the play, of course, was going to suffer. And something terrible happened. Christy Mathewson, who was a great, great pitcher, was gassed during training and was never the same after that and died at a very young age. And the season of 1918 had to be curtailed and ended on Labor Day instead of playing out the full length. So any records set that year were shortened because of that. But in 1920, two worst things occurred. Oh, and the first one is something we talked about last time, and that was the Black Sox scandal. Uh, just to review, in 1919, the White Sox had made the World Series, and they lost on purpose. They were supposed to be paid by gamblers. It never quite happened that way. But they lost on, for betting reasons. And when this finally came out, it was two years later when they found out about this. It was 1921, and when they were finally put on trial. And there was a commissioner, Kenis on Mountain Landis, that was put in charge, and even though they were found innocent in a court of law, he still suspended the players. And he said, you are banned from baseball for life because you are gambling on the sport. And that shook the American faith in the sport quite a bit. That was the biggest fallout from that. Not was not just for the players, it was for the public in general. And even worse than that, I think, was a, uh, a situation that took place in 1920. There was a quite notary, noted, uh, noted pitcher named Carl Mays who pitched for the Yankees. He was notorious because he threw a submarine pitch, which means almost underhand, and he was a brushback pitcher. In those days, a ball was used until it couldn't be used anymore. And he also was a spitball pitcher, so he would put tobacco juice or emery juice on the ball, and the ball was used until it was grimy. And one afternoon, a fellow named Ray Chapman of the Cleveland Indians was crowding the plate. He threw a submarine pitch, and Chapman never saw it, and hit him square in the skull. He dropped to his feet, tried to make it to first, was carried off the field, and died in a hospital the next day to make baseball not only uh, a, a sport that may be fixed, but could be fatal. And the public's uh, attitude toward baseball and it's going into the 21 season was devastating. What saved it, Jake? Babe Ruth, more than anything. Babe Ruth was the first superstar in baseball, and he almost single-handedly became the face of the sport and into the 20s and 30s was, well, not just baseball's golden age, it was sports' golden age. Boxing was huge, football was huge, and so that he became the face of baseball in general, and he brought it back from, from nothing. And history yeah. students would know that the 20s were called the age of Ballyhoo. Yeah. It was the <laughs> great golden age of the Hearst newspapers. And so the Hearst loved baseball. They loved football. They loved boxing. They loved horse racing. And people living high, wide, and handsome all through the 20s. And so the sport rode the crest of that wave for the next 20 years. It was a hugely popular sport. The All-Star Game was begun in 1933, and even during the Depression, the one thing that did not suffer was baseball, and of course the Yankees, and then the great Lou Gehrig episode with the luckiest man on the face of the earth. All sorts of great stars appeared during that time. And so the 20s baseball just flourished uh, primarily because of the nature of the times. The times dragged it along. And yeah. the newspapers, too. And the newspapers. If radio yeah. was just coming into fashion. There certainly wasn't any TV. So the newspapers were how you followed your sports, and that's how people fo followed their teams other, th other than going, which very few people could do. And you the newspaper writers were stars into themselves. Sure. People like Grantland Rice, for instance, mm -hmm. became uh, as popular as some of the writers are today, of like Peter Gammons is well known, even though he's not a player. But that was the, the golden age. The players rode the trains. I mean, the, the newspaper writers rode the trains with the players. They were sometimes paid by the clubs. And so that the, uh, the, 
their stories were in every paper. And the papers in those days came out in the morning and at night, so you'd see people going to work reading a story, coming back from work reading another story. Okay. And so it really thrived during that time until World War II. World War II. <laughs> World War II, of course, was an enormous conflagration. And in 1942, baseball determined that because so many baseball players had been drafted, ultimately 500 major league ball players had to enter the service, that they considered closing down baseball altogether. And what saved it was the intervention of, uh, intervention of Franklin Roosevelt, who said baseball is necessary to give the people some diversion to take their minds off the war. And so it continued. And another league began. And, yeah, there were, this was also the rise of the Women's League, which if you've seen a league of their own, you know quite a bit about how that worked. But just to draw a bigger audience to the sport, there was a Women's League that took place in many cities and drew very well by the time, uh, by the, time the war was, uh, was ending and the Major League players were coming back. Because the 500 players you were talking about, that's pretty much every big name in the majors, too. These weren't scrubs that were getting drafted. All the big Bob's stars were going into the war. Bob Feller yeah. was the first one to enlist yeah. in the service. Yeah, but Bob Feller, Ted Williams, I mean, pretty much every name uh, every player name. you could think of in the 40s were all drafted, which left the product something to be desired in the major leagues. So hence the women's league and the Negro leagues also were well, the doing Negro very well. The Negro flourished too. because the Negroes at first weren't drafted. Of course, they were later, but they weren't allowed to fight with the whites for quite a while. And so you had a product in 1944, the St. Louis Browns won the pennant with a one-armed outfielder named Pete Gray. He had one arm. He had 244. And uh, it was just, it was sort of a gimmick. And I heard uh, later on he was quite embittered by the fact that he'd done that. But baseball was still baseball. People had something to do, something to watch. They had to play all afternoon games because of the blackout restrictions. And they couldn't travel very far because of the travel restrictions. But the, the same 16 teams that came in in 1901 were still in the same places. So they survived. And that was probably the biggest overall threat to the continuation of baseball. And just as a Red Sox fan, that's sort of sad because if the Red Sox had been able to field the team in those years, those would have been phenomenal teams. Johnny Pesky, yeah. Ted Williams, yeah. Dom DiMaggio, yeah. uh, all great players. Yeah. And when they did come back, they won the World the, the they won almost the, won the World Series. Almost won the World Series in 46, <laughs> but all those those guys were right in their prime years in the early to mid-40s. And unfortunately, Sox fans never got to see them play for very long because of the, of the war. So. Now, we'll, we'll continue that later about Red Sox uh, <laughs> being victim to rules. Now, because the country was changing, yeah. you have to remember that the country did not have 48 states until 1912. Uh, I just looked this up. In, in the year 1900, Arizona territory had 5,000 inhabitants. All the baseball teams were in the north and northeast sections of the country. Nothing was south of Washington and nothing west of St. Louis. So it was all in this part of the country. But after World War II, the expansion to the westward and the central states was enormous. And so in 1953, first, teams began to swap franchises. Mm -hmm. yep. The Boston Braves, Braves were the first ones to leave. They went out to Milwaukee. The next year, the St. Louis Browns came to Baltimore. So for the next 10 years, franchises swapped places. And the catastrophic one for New Yorkers was when the Dodgers and the Giants left their homes in New York and went out to California. Went all the way to the West Coast. Especially so yeah. the Dodger fans. I've met many friends of mine from New York that quit baseball altogether because they lost their beloved Dodgers. Mm -hmm. But it messed with the people, but it also opened it up to the big market. It's business again, folks. Mm -hmm. The market in the West Coast was enormous. The Dodgers for a while played in Chavez Ravine where there were 100,000 seats. And sold the place out. <laughs> <laughs> and it also affected not only uh, the, it, it wasn't only a population difference it, within the game, it also affected travel. Because now you have teams that have to go to the West Coast, which led to 10 o'clock games, which we all <laughs> love on the East Coast here. But that was just another thing that was different about the game and the way it was played is that you now had a more extensive travel schedule. You couldn't take a train all over the place anymore. You had to fly train to the West Coast. Just wiped out completely. Mm -hmm. And a lot, of play, a lot of teams now, like the Dodgers, have their own jets. They just fly people around themselves, but it's much different than the, the travel they had. And it, it begat night games. Uh, it did away with double headers, and uh, the, the travel became a factor they built in. 
they now have to have a day off every 19 days because the travel is sometimes worse than the games themselves. It's the fatigue that's involved. Sure. Oh, the West Coast trips, we all know about those. <laughs> and especially the Mariners, who now have to travel more than any other major league team because of their location. That's something that you have to build into the schedule. But the next thing that happened was also because of the population shifts, there were different population centers popping up in the U.S. It wasn't just New York, L.A. There were more cities that had a desire for baseball. So that led to expansion. And in 1961, there were two new teams that popped up, the California Angels and the Washington Senators, and there was an explosion of teams all through the 60s to try to keep up with the demand for baseball and the shifting populations of the U.S. into other cities. And yeah. so over the years... Uh, I think 97 was the last one with the Rays. Uh, there are now 30 teams. 14 new teams were added. Now, that's a positive for the general populations. But you think about it. There were 16 teams. That's 400 players. Now, there's 30 teams. That's almost 800 players. Are there 800 good players or not? The watered-down players, that means 400 of the current players would not have made a major league roster 50 years ago. The answer to that is the expansion of the population we're drawing from. Mm -hmm. We've drawn That's especially true. from the South American teams, the Latin teams. Mm -hmm. Where a Latin team in the a Latin player in the 50s, I can remember Sandelio Consuegra playing for the Senators in the 50s. Now, many teams have as many Spanish speaking players or Latin mm -hmm. players as they do. Mm -hmm. uh, either black or white players. Sure, and, and even now it's expanding all the way into Asia with the right. rise of Japanese, of Japanese players, players coming in, too. Korean players. So yeah. World Series now is much more of an a honest moniker than it had been. Uh, so that there are probably, the, the quality of play now probably hasn't dropped or maybe even increased. Yeah. Well, and, and what happens is when you have a, when you have too many players for too many spots, the quality of play goes down. And that's what happened through the 60s when teams started expanding. And, uh, and that's why if you look back on the 60s, the pitching stats in the 60s are out of this world because the pitchers were so dominant through that decade, which led to another rule change. It's easy to get more good pitchers than it is good hitters. Mm -hmm. It's actually, believe it or not, more difficult. The extraordinary pitchers, perhaps, but... Uh, to get a person who can hit a ball coming in at 100 miles an hour, especially with the relief pitches that do it all through the game now, what happened in 1968 changed the face of baseball. In 1968, Bob Gibson pitched a full season with a 1.12 ERA. Denny McLean won 31 games, and Kadia Stremski led the American League with a 3.01 average, the lowest average in the history of baseball. Pitching had totally dominated. And it was not good for baseball. Uh, maybe, uh, do you want to go to a football game that ends in a 9-7 score? A basketball game that ends up 50-33? to 33 Or a or soccer game that ends with no score, no score which at all. It was probably why it never caught on in the U.S., but so, different story. In order to create more, at first, the first step in order to create more offense was to lower the pitching mound by 5 inches. So it was dropped from 15 down to 10, so the pitcher isn't coming from a bigger, a different angle. The way pitchers counted with that was to get bigger. So Randy Johnson, Johnson at 6'10", is yeah. right. He added those five inches right back onto yeah. the mound. Yeah. <laughs> when he throws his arm is about two feet from you, uh, <laughs> and the, and to also try to boost some offense into the game. The next big rule change that we're going to get into in depth was the designated, designated hitter. hitter in 1973. Uh, the the American League, not the National League, just one league adopted the designated hitter, where the pitcher didn't have to bat. You have one player who doesn't take the field and just is a pure hitter, which led to all kinds of pros and cons, depending on what your opinion of the DH is. Uh, and it, it led to some interesting quirks in the rules because you now have one league with a different set of rules than the other league, which is still to this day they're trying to figure out the best way to, to, to handle that. What it amounted to, essentially, was that the pitcher no longer batted because throughout the game's history, the pitcher was terrible. And as early as 198, Connie Mack tried to get a DH in because he had two turned out to be Hall of Fame pitchers that couldn't hit a lick. Put somebody else to bat for them because they're just so bad, it isn't worthwhile. Uh, two or three times the, it was brought up before. It wasn't unique to 73. Mm -hmm. But 73, uh, they voted to put it in the American League. 
the batter can only the hitter can only hit for the pitcher. He can't hit for anybody else. And if he's taken out of the game, he can't come back in. He can't go play in the game. You lose the DH. But that is that has been the rule now for two generations of people. So anyone coming up from Boston figures it's the way it's always been. The National League hasn't used it ever. And the conflict between the points of view on that, we won't get into today. Yeah. But I've seen some pretty heated arguments. Oh, on both sides. Both sides. <laughs> sure. You know, your league, a pitcher in your league gets automatic 40 strikeouts more a year. Sure. Uh, yeah, yeah, your pitchers aren't really athletes because they can't play they both can't, ways. Yeah, yeah. And one of my favorite arguments is, in the American League, you can't throw at the pitcher in case he throws at you. So Pedro could be a headhunter and they don't get a chance to throw back. It's sort of the mafia attitude toward baseball. You should have a chance to brush the pitcher back if he brushes you back. Sure. Uh, we're not going to take sides, but they're quite quite extreme some sides com on there. Compelling arguments And it on has made sides. some difficulties sure. in the World Series, of course. Sure. What they've done is in the National League parks, we don't use a, a DH and uh, they do in the American League. Just as a, for instance, in this upcoming season, which will probably be underway as you see this show, the Sox open in Philadelphia, which means that David Ortiz can't play. He's the cornerstone of their entire offense. They have the option of having him play first and sit Mike Napoli down, who happens to be their hottest hitter in spring training or not. So you take the whole heart out of the batting order, have to rearrange and have other people compensate to do that, and that'll be the first three games of the year. Uh, when my wife and I went to San Francisco and David Ortiz couldn't play, the people started to chant, we want Ortiz, because it's a chance for the National League to see some of the stars in the American League, which is outlawed. Mm -hmm. But uh, on the other hand, uh, it does keep a player who would ordinarily be on his way up from playing. It adds extra strategy, the infamous double switch they have sure. in the National mm -hmm. League. Mm -hmm. And so there's arguments on each side. And interesting, is it hasn't been changed yet. I just read this the other day. I guess I'd either forgotten or didn't know it. The National League voted to adopt it in 1976. There were 12 teams, and they said the simple majority, seven clubs want it, we'll have it. And if seven or what, more than six don't, we won't. So when they took a straw vote, four teams wanted it. Five teams didn't, and there were three swing teams. Now, I think it was the Phillies general manager had been told by his owner to vote for it, and the Pirates had agreed to go along with the Phillies. When the vote came, the general manager tried to get in touch with the owner to see if he'd change his mind. His owner, the owner was in the Caribbean or someplace, mm -hmm. and so he cast his vote with the knots. The Pirates followed him, and it went down 7-5. to five. It's never been brought up mm -hmm. since. Mm -hmm. If a National League owner hadn't happened to be in Nassau or yeah, wherever, right. when that vote was taken, it would have been a uniform rule sure. all these yeah. years. How's that for a, yeah. a simple little coincidence? Yeah. Huh? And not to get into it too much, it sort of comes down to are, are you more into the offense or more into the strategy you know do you want to see David Ortiz make a team and hit lots of homers or do you want to see Eric Bruntlett go in in the sixth inning and pinch hit for a double switch and where they move the pitcher around and, and they no address secret, the, the, the aging yeah. sluggers would rather come to the American League and just look at who signed just this past year who signed the, the stars to sign Lester went to the National League mm -hmm. and and uh, the Detroit guy uh, oh, Scherzer. Scherzer. Went, oh, no, why, not, <coughs> why not go to a league where you get a, a sure, probably a sure out uh, every inning? So there's, there's two arguments about that. That's, sure. I don't say it's, it's, it's the first major change in the way the game has ever been handled. And it's, and it's sort of a dividing line between uh, are you a traditionalist or are you yeah. sort of a, a progressive with the rules? But you know, enough on that. We'll move on. So you no. could, we could do a whole show on that. Along the same time, <laughs> a, a, a thing that, didn't seem to be that drastic at first, but it's become very drastic, was free agency was accomplished. A fellow named Marvin Miller, who should be in the Hall of Fame, read through the contracts that they serve. And the way that you were bound to a team, which they considered indentured servitude, was that it read, if you fail to sign a contract, the team can give you an annual uh, a contract for the next year at the same salary. And it says, for the next year, that all it reads the concept was interpreted as being for perpetuity. Miller sued and found that to be not true. So if a player sat out a year, he was a free agent. Mm -hmm. And so the free agency came in. The owners said it's going to destroy baseball. It'll put all the poor teams out of business. But that's how exactly how free agency came to be. And now free agency is a free-for-all every season. And players swapping all the time. 
And what, what it did was it upped the salaries fantastically. Just a quick episode. Uh, 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 it, what do I want? Ep example. That's yes. the word. Okay, quick good example. Teacher, huh? Yes. <laughs> uh, a good, good example. Jim Boughton. I've been reading Jim Boughton's book. Held out for a salary in 1969. He settled for sixteen thousand dollars a year and was thrilled. Last year, forty years later, Jonathan Papelbon received thirteen million dollars. Last year, Jonathan Papelbon pitched sixty-six innings. He recorded two hundred outs. That figures out to seventy-five thousand dollars per out. In a single inning, he makes two hundred and twenty-five thousand dollars. So what that has done to baseball's economics is put it extraordinary. And the bottom line is that's why you pay so much for a taker. So by the players making more money, which perhaps they deserve because the market bears what it can, but the family baseball outing now is, is pretty rare. To be able to buy four tickets to go to a game with the average price at Fenway is close to 100 bucks a ticket. And it's not just the superstars, even the rookies. Uh, 30 years ago, you made 62000 as a rookie, minimum. Now the minimum, I believe, is half a half million, million dollars. Half a million dollars. If you make the if you make the roster, it's a half a million dollars. Salary. So more than any of us will see in our lifetimes. <laughs> they make for one season just making a major league roster. And and it's you're right. It, it doesn't just affect the people going to the park. It also affects ad revenue because, as we said, it's a business. Yeah. So if you're trying to sign big players for more money, guess what? That means that your sponsors are going to shell more money out to get you to sign those big contracts. And so. what and what that beget was the infamous player strike in 1981, the first of two devastating strikes. In uh, 81, they decided that their contract with all the revenue that was gotten, for instance, they get revenue from baseball cards and equipment sales and so forth. Their percentage, there were three or four items that they argued about. So they went out on strike and they, you can explain what happened with the Well, what, hap what happened is the strike happened in the middle of the season, and it was resolved after, I believe it was about two months, they resolved yes. the, the strike. And they, so they came back and played a second half of the season. So what Major League Baseball did, again, a lot of these rules we're discussing were not, uh, were not refined in the first place. They took tweaking over the years. What Major League Baseball decided to do was have a first-half winner and a second-half winner play against each other. So, for example, when the strike ended in the first half of the season, if you were in first place in your division, you made the playoffs. And if you won the second half, you made the playoffs. And what ended up happening, a great example, the Cincinnati Reds had the best record in baseball. They didn't make the playoffs because they were second place both halves in their division. So it led to this whole convoluted playoff in 81 where it stretched on for about a month. So there was a whole extra round of games that happened just to get out of your division. And then there was the championship series and the World Series. And uh, it led to some chaos. And uh, unfortunately for the Expos, that was the last time they ever made the playoffs and they almost almost got to the World Series. So one of the uh, ways baseball uh, counted that was expand the playoffs. Expand the playoffs, put another <laughs> round in. in. <laughs> but it was just a, that was just a quirk of that one season where they probably didn't approach it right, you know, but the, the strike led to a direct change in the rules, and that's some, sort of something that they've had to work around, which we'll get to later when there's another strike that happens. Which is, yeah. the yeah. I would still, to this day, say the most devastating thing that ever happened to baseball was the strike in 1994. They simply canceled the season. Uh, and so from mid-season, they stopped play. Everybody went home. They canceled the World Series. Imagine that. It had been unbroken since uh, 1903, 1903 uh, except the 1904 when the McGraw wouldn't play. Yeah. Through two wars, they'd never missed a World Series. They canceled it all together, and that really put the kibosh on a lot of fans' loyalties that have never come back in some places. Toronto had won the World Series in 92 and 93. Toronto's attendance dropped precipitously after mm -hmm. that. And a lot of the fringe teams that didn't have strong teams anyway, I wouldn't say have still gotten it back in some sure. places. And People just said yep. they're too greedy. It's a fight between millionaires. The players are making plenty of money. The owners are making plenty of money. The hell with both of them. And it destroyed baseball in Montreal. In 1994, the Expos had the best record in baseball when the strike happened. They had Pedro Martinez. They had a lot of up-and-coming stars. And the fans in Montreal never came back. And within... 15 years the franchise had moved it there's no such thing as the expos anymore so especially the two canadian teams got hit very very hard with that by that strike so what yeah. saved that unfortunately 
steroids. Steroids. The steroid era began. And who could ever forget the 98 season? Yep, 98 season with McGuire and Sosa both chasing Roger Maris's record. And it was national news. It wasn't just baseball news. You know, we remember Tom Brokaw coming on every night after night saying, oh, today McGuire hit a homer, Sosa didn't. They both stand at 52 with a month to go. And stadiums had part of their scoreboard with, you know, Boston plays New York today. And under that, it would say Sosa McGuire, and it would have how many for many homers each one of them hit. That's how much it captured not just the baseball world, but the rest of the country. They even added a yeah. home run hitting contest to the All-Star game, a whole extra day to see these beefed up guys play. I, I was caught up in it. I can remember seeing oh, sure. that game yeah. when McGuire hit the home run. He came around the bases and he picked up his son and carried him around. It was like a national celebration. Baseball was back, unfortunately, as it turned out, for a terrible reason. But that's actually what brought people back after the strike. Oh, it's in one of those iconic images in baseball is McGuire circling the bases and the Cubs are high-fiving him as he's circling the bases. <laughs> and Sosa comes out of right field. They happen to be playing each other when he broke the record. Sosa gives him a big hug and they give a big high-five to each other. So they were rooting for each other, too. So it was also within baseball, it was very captivating, not just for the fans and the national McGuire audience. McGuire went over and it was embraced by the Maris family. Mm -hmm. it, it, was, it was like heartbreaking news. Uh, it, it was the lead story in the, in the news that time. And so the strike was forgotten. And then all of a sudden comes out the story reports. And you find out that these people are all cheating, all taking illegal substances. And so uh, they were either banned for baseball or suspended. They were on national television testifying in Washington. And this report came out and uh, the people like uh, Alex Gonzalez was uh, humiliated. And it still is to this day because of that. And so let's do something else. How about interleague play? Oh, interleague play. Interleague play. That'll get us all back. <laughs> so, so here, and again, this is another big, along with the DH, probably the biggest rule change that's happened in, in, in recent baseball history is that the American League and National League never used to play each other during the regular season. They only met in the World Series. Which made the World Series really sight. Sure. Our league is better than your league, and one seven-game series could determine just that. Sure. And But to try to, again, get the public's faith back and boost revenue, interleague play happened. So now American League and National League teams were playing each other during the season. And there is a whole set of pro and cons, again, about that, uh, because you now had two teams playing each other that had different rules. So how do you combat that? The American League has the DH, the National League doesn't. So how do you, how do you deal with that? from series to series. And I think they're still kind of grappling with the question of how best to deal with that they, all these they, years they've later. They've tweaked that all the time. It, originally, it was for two or three weeks in June. Yeah. All the interleague play took place at the same time. There was a problem. The American League had 16 teams. The National League had 14. And so two teams had to play each other that weren't interleague play. But essentially, the interleague play was all done at the same time. You got it out of the way. And the DH that had to play in the nine games... Uh, couldn't play in the nine games in the National League and the pitches that had to bat and so forth. That was taken care of. What happened, though, recently, was that Houston was switched from the National League to the American League ostensibly to balance it so every single division has five teams. Previously, uh, the AL West was the AL? AL West the AL had, West four, had teams. four teams. And the Central Division of the National League had, had six. six. Go figure. So it wasn't fair. There was differences. So they swapped that. But you can't do that. You can't have an odd number of games or leave some teams not playing. So now there's an interleague game all season long. As I said before, the Sox open against the Phillies. Their first home opener is against the Nationals. So this interleague play is scattered throughout the season. And no longer does it have the sort of um, glow to it to see the interest level because there's an interleague game every single day. And the original idea was so you can get to see. I never saw Ernie Banks play, for instance, as he sure. played with the Cubs. You get to see each other's teams play. But it sort of wears. The original idea, too, was to have a lot of what they call Subway Series, so the Mets could play the Yankees. Local That's rivalries, cool. yeah. Or, yeah. or the uh, Angels and the Dodgers play, or the uh, Cubs and the White Sox play. But who was the Red Sox natural comedy? They played, matched them up with the Braves, who well, played in Boston 65 years ago. Yeah. Uh, so the Subway <laughs> Series was from here to Atlanta back yeah. and forth. Mm -hmm. Now it's they split with the Phillies and Atlanta. 
but there are no natural rivalries. Oh, sure. I mean, my, think, the, think of some of the ridiculous. Oh, my ones. favorite one is the Rockies Mariners rivalry that they picked. <laughs> that that's a deep history right there with those two teams. So, th- th- well, it was it was good in some sense. In other in other terms, it was kind of ridiculous. The teams that just didn't have any history with other teams all of a sudden were natural rivals, and it. It, and at first, it, it did have some some appeal. You're right because yeah. I I know what what we did as soon as we found out. Oh, they're playing the Marlins. We've never seen them before. Let's right. go watch the Marlins at Fenway, or let's go watch them play the Mets at Fenway. That's right. And it did it 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 got you. It, you were able to see players that you were never able to see play. Like I never got to see Mike Schmidt in person sure. as a, as an '80s baseball fan because the Phillies are in the National League. Well, now Barry Bonds got to play at Fenway right. or other. National League superstars were able to come to your park, so you can say that I saw a Hall of Famer play at Fenway, which it is a is a pretty good upside when you think about right. it. But my wife and I had a lifelong quest to see the Red Sox play in every single park in the in the majors. We finally did all 31, including the Expos parks. But we would plan our summers on when they were playing and which National League parks they were playing in. Sure. Oh boy, they're playing in Chicago. Now we can go to see the, the Cubs play. Uh, the last one we got to see, we waited 20 years, was the Pirates. They didn't play the Pirates, so we went to do that. And interestingly, the Cubs came to Boston last summer for only the second time. There were more Cubs fans there than Red Sox fans because we weren't the first ones or the only ones to do this. People want to travel to see their teams and get to see other parts of the country, and especially to see Fenway Park, which is a iconic park. And so it, it does give fans a chance to travel to see their teams in other, other locations. I mean, the Red Sox-Yankees have always been back and forth. Red Sox-Dodgers, in fact, uh, Orioles. It, it, Orioles used to be called Fenway South after oh, a while. Oh, absolutely. So oh, oh, even uh, even about 10 years ago, before the Orioles started to get good again, we went to see a, a series in Baltimore in early September when the Orioles were out of it. It was two-thirds Red Sox fans. It was amazing how <laughs> many Red Sox Red Sox in the way park. Yeah. <laughs> so so, it, it, did, so it, it created some extra travel for the fans to go see places that they normally wouldn't see, not that they wouldn't go see Baltimore. And the, and but, the poor yeah. Rays. The yeah. Rays are outnumbered whoever they're playing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Especially Yankees and Red Sox yeah. fans. It's, oh, everybody's retired to Florida from somewhere else. Yeah, right, yeah. Too oh. many three or four generation Rays fans. You know? <laughs> so, and so what this also led into, and, and they couldn't have seen this coming at the time, is that part of its appeal was you get to see players that you never play before. Well, what happened just after that was the rise of television and TV contracts that teams had. You know, Back in, back in 1995, there was a, a, a fleeting start of a, of a baseball network. It was a one-season deal, and it flopped. They had all kinds of blackout issues. But in the late 90s, early 2000s, ESPN started televising tons of baseball games. The MLB network came into existence. So now you could see players that you wouldn't normally see all the time because every game is now televised. And so what that led to is teams getting their own TV network. That's right. The Red Sox own Ness and the Yankees have Yes. The uh, the Blue Jays have the Rogers the Braves network. Braves started it with the Turner Bra- network. Braves no. have TBS. The Cubs have WGN. So now there's just an enormous revenue that these teams who own the TV stations has, and it's because of the demand for baseball across the country has risen so much that you can see every game now. And right down to the MLB package on Comcast, you can pay to see every game now. Yeah. It's all been it's, it's all been computerized. You can't buy tickets from individual parks. It's all they're all regulated. Uh, so you go on to the MLB and you can see what you want tickets for. Then you want uh, trophies or whatever from each park. Mm-hmm. And so it's all been taken over as a corporate business with these thirty different branches, which has brought great revenue in and great advertising revenue mm-hmm. too. So the access to baseball. Any younger people out there won't believe this, but in 1956, 18 Red Sox games were broadcast, mostly on Sundays. It was like a, a Fourth of July every time for me. I could go. My grandfather had a TV. We didn't have a television. But the socks were on today. We go over and watch this flickering black and white show with one channel. I saw Mel Parnell's no hitter, and it was the highlight of my entire youth to see this game. Now you sit back here and in high definition, you watch all the games all the time, and plus all. All the other games, uh, all winter, you can see the replays of the games and talking heads going nuts about predictions and Kevin Millar yeah. screaming at them, everybody. And yeah. It's just nonstop baseball all the time now. So the other players and seeing the other players is, is uh, certainly 
no problem with access. Yeah, I, th I think my generation's probably the last one that had to hunker down and listen to a radio because the game wasn't broadcast on TV 38, which led to some late nights in the bedroom. Who listens to the ball games on the radio unless you're in your car or at right. the beach, maybe? Yeah, but, but, <laughs> now you can yeah, watch it on yeah. your TV or your little computers sure. anyway. But 30 years ago, that wasn't the case because oh. they only televised maybe half the games, if that, right. and the rest would all be on the radio. So you have to now, hunker I'll down honest, to your radio. Kurt Gowdy was yeah. my... The only person I remember as a kid, now I never listen to a ball game on the radio unless I'm in the car. Mm -hmm. You know, it's Jerry Remy now. Right. And, but also what that led to, tying back into what we said about the free agency, is that this makes baseball contracts even bigger. Because the teams have more revenue. Now you can pay, uh, you know, the Red Sox paid Manny Ramirez $25 million a year to come to the Red Sox because they had the revenue from the advertisers and the TV channels and all this extra stuff that they never had access to That's before. Right. And now you have, uh, who was it, Prince Fielder side for $30 million a year, which is extraordinary. This should bring it home to Lunenburg residents. Lunenburg's current school was costing $72 million. A-Rod's contract is to $250 million. He could build three schools for which you play one ball player. But before you criticize that, it's what the market will bear. I, you know, tickets at Fenway average about $100, and they're sold out. They were sold out for 13 or 14 consecutive years. People will pay that money. Yeah. And so baseball is, uh, is thriving. Uh, they say football has become the national sport. Well, maybe, but football's only one day a week. Until they did Monday night and Thursday night Thursday, and yeah, Saturday right. night. But uh, it, was, it was something every single day there's a ball game on. Every day. You can, and mostly night games. Come home from work. What a great way to unwind. I don't know how many players or people I met in, in Lunenburg, elderly people that love to spend the night with the Red Sox. Uh, who, who wouldn't be doing that otherwise? But it's available, it's accessible. There's no way they're going to go to Fenway or go to Yankee Stadium. But one lady I was talking to just the other day up at the library, she's going to be pushing 90, and she's really concerned about our catching situation. Uh, in fact, there's a checkout girl down at Hannaford's who is devastated that Christian Vasquez has been hurt. My like, Christian can't play this year. And it, it reaches everybody at all levels, like I don't think any other sport does. Uh, football, when it reaches Super Bowl, with all the hype of the halftime show and the two weeks preparation and so forth. But baseball is every single blessed day. And its hold is strong and healthy. And you can see all the obstacles it's had to overcome. It's managed to do it. With a couple little tweaks like the instant replay so the umpires don't make any mistakes. And we'll see how this thing with the clock works out this year. Sure, see, this yeah, generation yeah. Is, uh, is so used to... Uh, Instant gratification. Instant, instant gratification <laughs> takes too damn long, sure. you know. It's so it's, it's going to be quick. It's going to sure. be fast. I could sit through a doubleheader and wish there were more. Me too. <laughs> but this new generation has to have it quick and quick and soundbite mm -hmm. and so forth. And mm -hmm. so uh, they don't. But uh, we'll see how this works out. Uh, it's easy to knock something before it happens. Sure. So before we sign off, for you, Peter, the promise you didn't Google, here's the answer to our oh, trivia question. So, uh, so you may have known the JV question about the first designated hitter. The guy's name was Ron Bloomberg. He played for the Yankees in 73. The first, yep. the first game of interleague play happened to be the Red Sox and Yankees. He was the first one to bat. And interestingly, he was walked with the bases loaded by Louis Tiat, of all people. <laughs> So, now, the National League, I didn't know this till I looked it up myself, was Glenn Allen Hill of the Giants. The Giants happened to be playing an American League team in their first, chrono, it was maybe other games that day, it was the first one. So Glenn Allen Hill was the answer to the second. If you got that, you definitely get a gold star and a free appearance on our show. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> so in, in terms of the interleague trivia question, again, you had a 50-50 shot. The American League by far has a better record against the National League. It, it's, it's pretty significant. Interestingly, yeah. the first two or three years, the National League had the advantage, but mm -hmm. since it's been all American League. And the varsity question, I think you could probably figure, who else? The Yankees. The Yankees had the best interleague record. Remember, it started in 97, which was right at the peak of the Yankees' great years. Mm -hmm. uh, but let's add an extra one. Who has the worst record? The worst record in interleague play is the Baltimore Orioles. Go figure. Go figure. <laughs> Less than a 400 winning percentage over yeah. these 17 years. They were the last ones. So, so yeah. So we hope you enjoyed this, uh, and uh, we're definitely uh, we're definitely uh, going to do some more shows. And who knows? Maybe in a couple of years they'll come up with some new rule that we'll have another whole discussion about. <laughs> and we are taping this two days before the Sox opener, yes. so we hope to see you at the ballpark. Thank you very of much. Of course, Jake. thank you. We'll see you at the ballpark. See you at the ballpark. We'll see you all anon. Take care.